Raylene Castle. Welcome to Between Two Beers. Kia ora, thanks for having me. Very excited to have you in the Export Beer Garden studio tonight. We've heard you're a bit of a fan of the after-work wine. You ever get into the beers? <laughs> I do. Well, yes, I'm not always uh, uh, too concerned about the type. But no, I really enjoy an after-work beer. Um, sort of formed a huge part of my social um, work life, uh, friends engagement. So yeah, absolutely. Feel free to tuck into one. I, you did say beforehand there's a rule, right? Never have a drink when you're talking to the media. But we kind of blew the lines. I, yeah, I said we're podcasters, but it didn't. It just didn't. It didn't seem to permeate. So that's cool, respectfully. Yeah. Decline. So I'll be on the water for the moment, but afterwards I'm very happy to have a beer. Oh, sounds good. Um, I've really enjoyed researching this episode because, like a lot of guests, it's changed my perception of you. Uh, <laughs> I knew you were extremely competent and smart and tough. But I also only really knew you from newspaper headlines, and they don't show the real Raylene, but a lot of the stuff I've listened to and the stuff we're going to talk about, I feel like will show the real Raylene. The question at the end of that is, is it important for you that people know the real Raylene? Uh, the people that matter to me, it does. Um, you know, my friends and, and my colleagues and the people that I work with and the people that I'm in the environment to try and build trust and respect with, that's important that they know the real Raylene. Um, I can't control the other myriad of people that have read articles and seen things. I've had some funny situations. I did a um, leadership talk and um, after doing that, it was actually to a group of policemen and policemen put the head up, a hand up and said, I actually thought you were really useless, but after listening to you, I don't actually think you're too bad. <laughs> So, you know, people are, you know, have their pers perspectives and perceptions and I can't control that. I can only control what's in front of me. Nice little backhanded sort of compliment there. Eh? <laughs> totally. uh, so w the way we do things is we like to canvas friends and colleagues and family to, to get their perspective. And we've actually had access to Jenna Knight, who worked with you at the Bulldogs and Rugby Australia. And she's given us uh, a few little bits and pieces which we want to open with, which I think helps paint a picture. She says, perhaps the best example to sum up Raylene is this. During our time in Sydney, quite often on Sunday afternoons, Raylene would roast, would roast a leg of lamb for a group of friends, would be on the deck in the sun or watching footy at her baller apartment with a wicked view of the harbour and an awesome collection of art on the walls. We would drink wine, shoot the shit and be merry. A group of mates with shared values but differing opinions on most topics. We often found ourselves piling into Ubers way later than we should and therefore a little dusty on Monday, but not Raylene. She would be energised, cup full, social battery recharged and ready to take on the week. I've very rarely seen her miss a beat. Oh, and the leg of lamb, it would be the best you've ever had. And she doesn't even like lamb. <laughs> <laughs> does that sound right? Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, I'm at the extra at end of the scale, I get my energy from being around people, particularly people that are positive and in that really good debate that, that Jenna talked about is something that's really important to me in art that I think we're losing um, in New Zealand and I'd, something I'd really like to see us bring back to be able to be respectful of other people's opinions and have that really good debate and discussion because that's where you get good ideas and um, ideas move forward. She definitely said, she said that as well, is that you're not afraid of conflict and often conflict I think can be misconstrued as being destructive versus yeah, testing and, and finding opinions and, and like you say, where the where the gold lies is sometimes in differing opinions. Is that something that you cultivate both professionally and personally? Yeah, and um, sometimes it freaks people out because you know I don't mind having a really good robust debate. It doesn't mean I don't like you, it just means that we're debating the issues or discuss. Um, my dad will tell the story of me sitting, um, you know, when I was really young with his best friend who unfortunately um, passed away quite young and, um, you know, debating an issue round in a circle until we found ourselves sitting on opposite sides debating it and then debating it back again. And um, Yeah, I do. I really enjoy that. Um, I think it does um, garner um, good, uh, robust conversation and debate and moves, as I said, moves things forward. So, yeah, I do. I enjoy it. Awesome. Jenna goes on. You're either one of two people. You respect Raylene Castle or you haven't met her yet. As a leader, she treats all staff with the same respect, which should be a given, but it isn't. She has an incredible ability to get to the heart of an issue and address that rather than get caught up in the noise like most of us do. She has sharp judgment and is clear and decisive, which is why so many are willing to follow her wherever she goes. There really isn't much that she's not good at in business and life. It's quite annoying. I wanted to ask you about that cutting through the noise. Um, you must get so much information on any given day. How do you decide on what is important to give your focus to? 
Yeah, and I think uh, one of the strange things is when you end up in a leadership role um, like I've done, sometimes you do wonder what you're good at. You think, you know, how, how, like, how have I got here? What um, are my skills? And, and that is one of the, the skills when you're a CEO and you might have seven um, direct reports and you've got um, a whole lot of issues going on, being able to move quickly from one thing to the next and be able to manage and deal with that information um, and cut to the issue, the heart of the issue, um, is really important and you know finding that um, ability to give people really clear and direct feedback so that they can go away and continue on doing what they need to do without um, getting distracted or tied down because you're not sure about um, or you need the overnight test. I'm not a great fan of the overnight test, I'm like in here. But that also means I've got to be cautious of people I work with who do need the overnight test so that they can actually, because not everyone can make the decision and feel comfortable with it and move on. So leading teams is the interesting piece is when you've got different personalities, um, it's really important to understand that. Um, but I certainly like to have the information in front of me, ask some good questions and then make a decision and move on. I'm, I'm curious about the breakdown in your work day between hard work, i.e. responding to writing emails, correspondence, etc., versus connection and connecting with your staff and being present because it's an interesting dynamic to be both doing the doing but also overseeing to make sure everything's working is is there a, a tipping point or a balance that you work to uh, a little bit of experience often feeling like I don't get it quite right uh, always naturally erring on the side of wanting to be with the people and having being involved in those conversations being part of that uh, um, conversation and engagement knowing that that's where the in my view, that's where the, um, you know, the sweet spot is that building relationships and bringing people together. Um, you can always do an email later, next day. Lucky to have some people that help me do that. Uh, and you know, if, if I have to do that after hours or while I'm sitting watching TV or whatever, I'll do that. But I never want to miss the moment to be with people um, in person. Um, I think that's where you can bring the best value. Um, people enjoy having the opportunity to engage with you um, and you can help move things forward. I have to um, I have to compliment you here as well because I uh, did some project management for Auckland City FC back during COVID time when we had travel restrictions and I was directly um, communicating with you I think while you're in holiday up north and it was Christmas holidays and you were great at getting back either informally or formally do you ever rest? Uh, yeah, I do, uh, but. I also am not someone that takes something with me. So like if, if I have to answer an email, I make a decision and then I leave that there and then I go back to reading my book under the Bahuda Kawa tree and enjoying the, going for a swim or whatever. I don't like stress or dwell on that thing that's in front of me. Um, and people, you know, people say, oh, you've got to go and have a proper break. Well, yeah, but actually if I don't answer something which holds everyone up for three weeks, that's not good either. So that discipline to, um, if you're going to do an hour, do an hour and then leave it behind, I've certainly taught myself to do over time. Yeah, I guess when you're at the top of that pyramid in such a powerful position, something which might take you an instant, someone else might spend a long time, a lot of time coming to that same sort of conclusion or realisation. Yeah, and I, and I think sometimes um, that's where people will find me maybe slightly brusque or short. So I don't do necessarily do the big, long, friendly intro. Oh, and waste you know, of time. Such like, a no, waste of time, right. isn't it? <laughs> that's exactly right. Hey, I hope this email sure finds you well, well this morning. <laughs> Get to the point. That's right. Like, and, exactly. And yeah. some people say, have said to me, you know, like you write emails like a boy, right? Like I'm in there, like going, you know. And because I just, and actually, um, you know, it's one of the disciplines I've tried to, um, uh, everyone's busy. So if it doesn't fit on the one page, or your phone on your screen, um, and you can't scan it over that period of time, it's too long. Yeah, so, nice. you know, less, more is not more. The skill of being able to say less and say it quickly and efficiently is way more skillful than writing a whole lot of words. I'm picking then that you're not the sort of person that says noted when you receive <laughs> when you receive an email. Like, that's one of my pet peeves. Is email while we're on email etiquette is that noted with thanks or received or, uh. or the thumbs up and the yeah. Facebook messenger. Oh, I know I do that all you the time that. to <laughs> deliberately wind people up. Um, um, oh no, I was going to go. Yeah, go ahead, man. Because uh, how important is the spirit of I'll figure it out to you in terms of jumping into a problem or dissecting? We talked about information information overload, but I don't know right now, but I'll go and figure it out. Is that something that you kind of subscribe to? Definitely, uh, but I also uh, believe in having good people around you, people that are smarter than you, better than you, 
understand the, the topic better than you do and bringing them into the environment really quickly. So um, I don't have to have all the answers, that's not my job. My job is to make sure that we bring together the best, smartest group of people we can find on that particular issue and then support them, lead them, um, help facilitate the conversation so that they get to a place where we can get to the answer. Um, I can't possibly have all the answers. Um, so bringing in subject matter experts, bringing in the people inside an environment and I've been lucky to work with some really great leaders and that's the, the thing that I've seen is they're, they're really willing to bring in those people that ultimately will be their successor. Um, but that's what good leadership looks like to me. Yeah, there's a real exercise in, in that kind of letting go of feeling like you're the only one that can solve the problem, particularly as you, as the organisations get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and you can't when, as I said, you know, when you might have seen right people reporting to you, they've all got deep knowledge of what they do. You can't possibly be into all of that detail and understand all of those things. But the art of being able to identify when it's not going quite right or taste it or smell it or listen or hear for it or, or equally when it's going really well so just let people play on um, is that art of leadership. In, really. in that regard, are you a gut leader? Yeah. Yeah. But that's experience though. You, I don't think that doesn't... Probably, hopefully, had a little bit of instinct right from younger, but um, that's absolutely experience because you start to have seen things over periods of time and therefore you start to understand where the dynamic's coming from and be able to jump on things earlier or make decisions about exiting people you know, quickly as opposed to going through a really long process that slows the whole thing down, as an example. So, yeah, that comes with experience. We've been trying to think of where to start the Rayleigh Castle story from. And this is an anecdote I heard, which I think is the perfect place. So <clears throat> it's 2007, and you've been climbing the ladder at Fuji Xerox for about 10 years. You're driving home one day, listening to Radio Sport, when you hear an announcement that the CEO of Netball New Zealand has just stepped down. And what do you do? Uh, I made about six or seven phone calls within about four hours to people I knew that were in and around that role and connected to it because it was, um, yeah, there was at that stage it was a dream job for me and an opportunity. I'd, I'd 15 years in the corporate sector, had um, innately was a sport person that had grown up in a household, wanted to work in sport, had a couple of opportunities previously that hadn't played out for one reason or another and, um, yeah, heard this. And that's the value of network. You know, that's the ability of building a network, keeping in contact, making an effort to say thank you to people and um, catching up for a coffee or a glass of wine or a beer or whatever. Uh, so that when that moment comes, you can get to those people quickly and they, can, they might not be the decision maker, but they do influence because they're at the table having conversations. Uh, and so, yeah, that was that moment and yeah, managed to fortunately get on the shortlist um, for that job, go through some good rigorous interview process and got appointed and... Um, yeah, I felt like I'd come home. But that, that, that's different, right? Like we get people who have reached the top of their field and I don't know, they say it like it's normal, but like making six calls in four hours, knowing that there's something that you want to get and doing everything you can, moving hell and earth to get it. The, like immediacy, drive, the immediacy yeah, as well. That's is, the drive is, that I was kind of getting at, like the fire that's there, right? To get what you wanted. Yeah, and I suppose I don't really think about it like that. I mean, I am certainly determined when I set my mind to something and decide that that's where I'm going to go. Um, you know, having a, a plan in place without sort of like a you know, sit down and write a plan and have it all sort of like drafted out. It's just like instinct. This is what I need to do. Let's get on with it and do it. I've heard you use the term sponsors in quite a different... Is that in a different context? Is that what you're talking about in terms of that network? Sp sponsors as in people that will advocate on your behalf? Is that, have I got that kind of right? Yeah, 100%. And that's where I think the single biggest thing that will change the gender diverse gap that we have at the moment um, is those sponsors, so those influential males traditionally, uh, when someone rang them and said, you know someone good for the CEO of Netball New Zealand job, and they gave three male names, what you want them to do is give two males and a, and a female name or one male and two female names. So those very influential people I've been fortunate 
uh, to have built relationships with. I've had some great ones in New Zealand. I built some relationships in Australia with some really key people. Uh, and, and you know that when someone's going to ring them or they're at a barbecue or they're in a situation of saying, oh, so what do you think about that, Rayland Castle? What do you think about John Smith or whatever? Um, they have some good context to add into that situation. So those male sponsors in that context um, are really valuable. And, and that also goes, reigns true in terms of areas like the rainbow community as well, right? Like a TJ Peronata who's super vocal and super supportive in that space. Is that, that's the term that you're using, right, sponsors, in, in that regard? Yeah, that's right. So they will talk positively and constructively and open the door for someone that's struggling or just talk in a really constructive way uh, as opposed to write you a cheque and we're sponsoring you kind of thing. It's that, it's that engagement, support from behind, um, you know, building that network of people that you know can advocate for your cause or your whatever you're trying to achieve. So that netball gig, you're 36 at the time which is young for a CEO, uh, and first sort of move into sport after that sort of career with, with um, Fuji Xerox, and smashed it by all accounts. It was, you know, New Ze- Netball New Zealand was semi-pro at the time. You helped it move wholly professional. They had a big broadcasting deal, which you helped land, uh, launched a profi- professional trans-Tasman comp, uh, took it to a place where female athletes in New Zealand could be pro in the first sport to do that. Did you know what you were achieving? Like as a 36-year-old CEO, you, you're making some pretty big moves here. Did you understand how awesome what you were doing was at the time? I mean, you know, there was a great team of people that we were working with that had advocated here in New Zealand for a long period of time. And I, you know, my arrival was um, timely uh, into that. Uh, did I know at the time? Possibly not. But when you sit there sort of three or four seasons later and see athletes that have been able to become professional um, have uh, options uh, to think about what a career playing netball full-time looks like whilst they're still studying and um, getting those qualifications. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty amazing moment. Uh, and, you know, genuine household names. Lots of silver ferns were um, because TV NZ had free-to-air broadcast, which was hugely important. Uh, but to bring that trans-Tasman level um, and be the first sport that was had a genuine five-five team um, trans-Tasman competition um, in a female context was yeah it was hugely. Um, I felt really proud to be part of a team that had brought that together. What, what were the foundation skills that you brought across from Fuji Xerox, from BNZ, and, and from Telecom as well that that held you in good stead through that transition from corporate to biz, uh, to sport? Well, it's that on the other side of the fence, so I knew what it was like when sports came to me and tried to sell me their dream of what a competition could look like. So what was a sponsor looking for? So I understood that bit. Um, it, uh, you know, the, I'm a great advocate of people who want to work in sport that having some really deep corporate experience first will stand them in really good stead. Um, the disciplines of, of business casing, of uh, P&Ls, of... Um, putting a really great sponsorship proposal together, knowing what that looks like, um, how to you know build the teams and um, you know put project plans and, and stuff in place. Those are all the practical realities of what happens behind the scenes. So to have, bring that experience across was uh, important. I think um, that it was more good luck than good management, but um, I had a strong commercial background. The CEO of Netball Australia had a great discipline in um, some of the internal health and safety structures, go- corporate governance, those things and so we were really complementary to one another and we ended up even though we um, you know competed fiercely against one another we ended up becoming very firm friends Kate Palmer uh, and uh, it was Kate and I's double skill set that actually brought the competition together and gave it equity across New Zealand and Australia so you know we didn't have to be the boss of each other we could complement one another's skill and go together and be look like a united front which in that environment was really important. Before we take a detour across the ditch to the dogs can I Take us just to learnings from the late Sir Peter Blake, because I understand you work closely with him with America's Cup. What did you take away from that interaction or those interactions? I was lucky I travelled as a, um, on America's Cup marketing com- committee from 98, 99, 2000. And when um, they l- launched the hosting of the competition here in, um, or the event here in New Zealand, we travelled around New Zealand for 13 weeks. So I had Sir Peter and Blake um, bailed up for 13 weeks asking him like a gazillion questions. He must have been so sick of me by the end of that time. Uh, But he was one of those guys that had a very small network of people around him and he didn't trust easily. But I I was fortunate to build that trust over that 
13 weeks where um, he he sort of expanded his net and started to include me in some things. And when you've had someone that's that high profile, um, you know, sailed uh, round the world, been successful, pitch black, middle of the night, n- navigation, containers, whales, all of that stuff, that's, you know, there's lots of learnings in the middle of that. And I dug right into it over those 13 weeks. He would have some stories to tell. Um, one of the details which I liked about your time at Netball New Zealand <coughs> Was in that time you went from twelve provinces to five zones, and there were you went on road shows, and you said that you answered every single question at every place you went to. You stayed until all the answers were taken care of, or if you didn't know it, you'd go away and get the information and go back to you. Was that like? Tell me about that. <laughs> I didn't have a question there. I just <laughs> well, it builds trust, you know, because you've got a, a group of really anxious people that don't want people fundamentally don't like change, change innately. Yeah. Um, they were going to have to give up their presidency or their blazer or their role uh, to believe in something. And netball has done it three times and would be the sport in New Zealand that's led the way for females giving up their piece for the betterment of the sport. Uh, And the fact that we were prepared to go with a presentation and then stand there until the last question was asked built trust. Um, So they... Uh, saw that I was, you know, brought into the situation, and that, as you said, if I didn't know, I'd go away and find out. But um, that's about building that trust and respect with a, you know, right across New Zealand when you're trying to make really significant change. Was there resistance to that change out in the out in the courts, out in the clubs? <laughs> totally. And you know, <laughs> there's a wonderful woman from um, netball called Marion George, who um, North North Harbour. Um, very determined woman had been for a long period of time she gave me such a hard time and she absolutely ran me up and down the flagpole Uh, and um, every subsequent job I've got from then on she sent me a congratulations card and said hey congrats on the new gig really proud of you now that's about how you start here and you build trust and respect over time to have someone that's you know so that that time invested always comes back to you so the Raylene Castle brand is building six great years with Netball New Zealand, and then you become CEO of the Bulldogs. I'm really interested in that transition phase, like how you, specifically how you got the job. Do you get headhunted for that? Do you, did you apply for it? Like, Were you listening to an ad on radio? <laughs> when did, you, did, you have, did you have Radio Australia Sport Ooh. playing? Yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit of all of those things. Um, six years, I'd gone to my chairman, Rowan Lovett, and said. Um, the six years is enough. Um, you need someone else to go to the next stage of, of take netball to the next stage. Uh, and I'm a great believer that also you can't stay too long. You've got to call it when you think that your time is um, ready to go. So I'd gone to her and, and she, they were the board and Ray were very supportive of helping me transition and, and giving me the space to find that next opportunity. Um, and I was um, I got a phone call from the recruiter saying, would you put your name forward for the Bulldogs job and I said do you seriously think they'd consider appointing a woman and he said I've asked the question and yes I think they will be. So I flew to Australia, had an interview um, and walked out after that interview and thought well I don't think I could have done any more, I think it went as well as it possibly could but had no concept of whether they would appoint a woman knowing they'd come out of a salary cap scandal, they'd come out of a rape scandal. Um, you know, Todd Greenberg had been there as a CEO for a period of time and had given it some stability. But I, once I did get a point, I actually would end up turning up and say, "Oh, I'm Rayland Castle, the CEO of the Bulldogs." Of who would say, "Oh, you're from that rapist club?" Wow. Uh, which is pretty confronting when you're trying to build a new network in Australia. And uh, by the time I'd finished four and a half years later, that wasn't what people said. So that was, you know, that was a, a positive step forward. But yeah, it was a. Um, it was a really exciting moment. Um, Greg uh, was incredibly supportive. My partner Greg was really supportive because he had to um, give up his job uh, where he'd been at the warehouse for a very long time uh, and said, I'm with you 100%, let's go have an adventure. Uh, and it was amazing, but you get off the plane and you walk into a new situation and you realise you've left all of your network, all of your relationships, all of those six people that I could pick up the phone and ring about how to unlock things in New Zealand. <laughs> Uh, and that was a really big learning, and I probably really underestimated the power of that network that I'd built here in New Zealand uh, that I had to rebuild when I got to Australia. Was it the same strategy as Netball New Zealand of getting out amongst the fan? Because I don't have an intimate knowledge of, of rugby league and rugby league support, but I, 
I kind of do understand that people are pretty passionate about their local club. So was it a case of getting out in the community and, and putting a face to the role? It was exactly that, and it was lots of that, including they have, um, on game day, they have the kennel, which is where all the you know, really, really mad fans, mad, great mad fans sit. Uh, and I would literally, a couple of times a year, I would go and sit in the middle of the kennel and watch the game with them. It was also the best fun. Like That's how to have really great fun. It's a very passionate fan base. Um, a um, about a lar very large uh, proportion of Lebanese fans, very large portion of Muslim fans. Um, so don't drink, but party, um, drums, have a great time. It was incredible experience um, at the Bulldogs and uh, the cultural experience that we had, um, that Greg and I had during that time, was just. Um, you know, something that we'll never forget. And uh, but it but it takes time, energy, work, input, taking time to sit, listen, learn. And which was a bigger challenge, or, or does it pale in comparison, being female or being Kiwi, in taking that role? Kiwi wasn't as big in rugby league because I walked into the environment and there was six Kiwi players in the environment. And they just started calling me auntie from day one. Hey, auntie raised eyebrows, you know, the whole auntie. <laughs> yeah. um, and that was amazing, made me feel incredibly welcome. And they were really supportive. And I always knew they kind of had my back. Um, the female thing was probably was much more curiosity and suspicion. Uh, rugby is slightly different. Rugby, the Kiwi thing was, I think, was probably equally as big as the female thing. Did you think about the fact that you were the first female CEO of a NRL club like when you're on the plane and you're heading over there that like this is, is quite historic and quite momentous like did you think it's about not been that? done since as well has it you've the one and only for, for now right did, did you think about that and did you have any doubt did you have any doubt in your abilities so funny story I was sitting um, I went to Australia it hadn't actually been announced yet uh, but um, it had leaked which is Rugby league, right? Rugby league leaks like a sieve. There is no th no such thing as secrets in rugby league. And I was sitting on the plane, um, and I looked across, and the man was sitting reading the newspaper, and he opened the newspaper like that, and he was a massive photo of me <laughs> <laughs> beside me going, Rayleigh Castle expected to be announced as Bulldog CEO the next day. So that's pretty confronting, that first moment. Um, yeah, of course, doubt. Um, nervous because you go into a whole new environment. Uh, I think the sports administration stuff, you know, I'd had some good experience. Corporate stuff had some good experience. But you're talking about going in and sitting alongside some legends of Australasian sport. Uh, you know, the Phil Goulds, the, you know, sort of, um, you know, Nick Politis's, the Shane Richardson's, if you like. Um, and... That's pretty scary. Uh, you walk in and Dad and I had spent literally hundreds of hours watching rugby league on Winfield Cup on a Sunday afternoon and we had this dumb saying that um, when we watched the Bulldogs that Terry Lamb was the best backer-upper, there's no such word obviously, but the best backer-upper <laughs> in the game rugby league and I arrived at the Bulldogs and like he works for me. Yeah, bar. Did you call him, how long till totally. well, well, you called him bar? <laughs> well, uh, fit, like, uh, you know, hi Terry, Rayleigh, and he's like, it's bar, Rayleigh. So it's bar, right, because that's how it is. But... That takes a moment to get your head around because there's this person that when you were literally still wearing, you know, like you were 12, 14, 16 or whatever, to then <laughs> suddenly have that person, that's, you know, that's about, it's a big deep breath and um, make sure that you're thinking through that situation. Because you've got some skin in the game though as well. You, for those that don't know, your father captain the Kiwis. Um, Bruce? Bruce. Um, and played in Australia as a... Well, like an overseas pro? I'm not sure if that's the right terminology, but played over there, which is where you were born. So presumably he's got a, his own little rugby league kind of community that he can call on, obviously a bit disconnected from the canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs, but you do have skin in the game. So it's not like you're going in completely blind and not knowing the ins and outs of the sport. No, and that was where, what made me feel um, more comfortable. Um, so I was born in Wagga, uh, which is where Steve Mortimer is from, who's a club legend Leech. for the Canary Mix and Bulldogs, absolute legend. Uh, and uh, so that there was sort of a connection because his name was Turvey, nickname's Turvey, uh, my dad coached Turvey Park, player coached Turvey Park. Uh, so, uh, and I could walk into a room full of rugby league people and name you all the great rugby league players in the room. 
So you're not going to make a complete idiot of yourself by walking up and putting your hand out to Laurie Daly and going, oh, hi, my name's Raylene, because I knew who Laurie Daly was. You know? So that was helpful because I wasn't ever going to... I fundamentally understood the game, so I could talk rugby league with the people um, that I was mixing with. So I wasn't, you know, calling, you know, not understanding the technical conversations of the game. Uh, and, yeah. was, was that in the interview process? Like, did they question your knowledge of the game? <clears throat> not knowledge as in you're there to coach the team because you're not, but enough knowledge to know that you're not going to be an idiot where you don't, you know, um, you expose yourself in a way that you'll get the eye roll. So, um, but equally you don't want to be the sort of dropping the detail of being the rugby league nuffy either, right? So you've got to get that balance right of understanding it, knowing how to write, ask the right questions, particularly in a high performance sense when you've got a head coach that reports to you. Um, knowing how to write, ask the right questions um, but not thinking that you're giving advice on selections or giving advice on recruitment, that comes with time and trust. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got a couple of follow-up questions if you, if you don't, if you don't <laughs> mind. I'm curious as to the, the role reversal of when you're introducing yourself to rugby league greats and you know who they are. Do they know who you are before you've entered the room? Do you know what I mean? Like when you're meeting Shane Richardson and Phil Gould and these people, are they going, ah, you're Raylene? I mean, it's obvious. It's pretty obvious because you'll be one of the only females in the room. But did your reputation precede you? Well, it did, um, only because it was splashed all over the newspapers, and I did you know, every major breakfast news um, show because they were interested in meeting me. And so when I got appointed, it was a really big deal in um, certainly the Eastern Seaboard terms. Uh, so uh, yes, they did. Uh, I was only telling someone last night actually that um, I was at a game and um, standing on the sideline and Gordon Tallis was about, I don't know, 10 or 12 metres away and he put his microphone down, walked across and said, oh, hi, Raylan, I'm Gordon Tallis, I just wanted to introduce myself. And there was a thing about rugby league, those really great players, the Andrew Johns, the Maddie Johns, the Gordon Tallises, um, they and Greg Alexanders, they all went out of their way to really make me feel welcome and really, you know, look out for me, I suppose. And in those stages, they were... Um, incredibly welcoming it's a very warm community rugby league because it's an everyday community it's just everyone plays rugby league there's no no one's more important than anyone else so it's, it is very welcoming was there a timeline or a moment when you felt comfortable when you felt like you know what i sort of belong here or i've got this under control so a little story uh i uh des hasler was a coach uh when i got there and when I got appointed, uh, or just before I got appointed, the chairman rang uh, Dears and said, we've got a preferred candidate for the CEO, but we need to talk to you. And he said, oh, sure. Uh, he said, uh, because she's a woman. And he said, I've only got one question. Do you think she's capable of doing the job? And he said, um, yes, I do. And he said, well, why are you talking to me then? Uh, and, and that was Dears, right? Dears didn't treat me any different uh, than if he treated any of his other CEOs. Um, I'm still the CEO that's worked with him for the longest period of time. <laughs> He's an interesting character. Because he is an interesting character. Um, but to, to answer your question, when did I feel that I really fitted? Um, so routine is, as a CEO, you watch the game, you go to every game, so 26 games across the year, so travel across Australia and New Zealand, watch games, and then um, straight after the game you go into the dressing room. And I would go into the dressing room and um, it would be, you know, you'd say day to the players, check if everyone was okay, talk to the coach, assistant coaches. And, but Dez had never really talked football to me. He'd, he was he was always like, he'd say day or how's it going or, you know, depending on if we won or lost. And then after about um, 18 months, I was standing there and he walked up beside me and he said to me, did that look as bad to you from where you were sitting as it did from the coaching box I went? That was the moment. Because yeah. that had crossed from just him coming to me and saying, can I have that new tech gear? Can I have the, that new, um, you know, GPS unit? Can I, you know, can you help me get this or the other thing? He actually took footy to me. And that was when it really kind of changed. Um, and I stay in touch with Dears. We have a very, still have a very connected relationship now. And, and I have such admiration for his ability to be um, totally supportive of me as a CEO. Uh, and he just did not care that I was female. One of my notes is to ask about Des because I have a spy which suggested you had a great relationship, but you also had some huge run-ins. Uh, we totally did, and but that was why he didn't treat me any different. 
he um, would uh, spit the dummy. He would, um, you know, on the odd occasion in my storm out of my office and slam the door. Um, and I don't know if you saw, when I got appointed, there's that really famous clip when he's at Manly and he slams the, the dressing room door and it falls off the hinges and just about hits Jamie Lyon on the head. Well, we had a few of those. Uh, but... That was great from where I was sitting because he didn't treat he didn't pussyfoot around or treat me any different. He just treated me like a CEO. I suspect some of the language he used was slightly different than if I'd been male, uh, but yeah, he was um, uh, he was great to work with, and and he he recognised I think also that we could be stronger together. We would uh, that, back to the conversation about good robust debate. We'd have good robust deba- debate about things. We'd move some things forward. We'd agree on some things, we'd say no to some things, but ultimately we knew we were trying to do something better for the Bulldogs. That run you went on when you got to the grand final, as the CEO of like an NRL club, like that, that wave must be like nothing else, right? Like that's huge. It is huge and it is like nothing else. And uh, I don't think you can really describe it, um, you know, one of the truly greatest moments in my sporting career um, to be part of something that creates a wave of momentum and the Bulldogs fans are very special. Um, They are literally painting houses, weatherboard houses, blue and white stripes, um, painting cars blue and white, um, you know, uh, 20 foot tall decals on the side of people's houses, um, dancing in the streets, non drop of alcohol but the drums out dancing and having a great time. And when you walk into a stadium, you know, 90,000 people and 45,000 of them got blue and white jerseys on cheering for the team that you're part of, that's something that is just, yeah, it's electric. We- and I'll ne- never, never forget that moment. It would have been nice to raise the trophy, but... One of the key differences, I guess, between Netball New Zealand and, and the Bulldogs' role, to, to compare those those two, is that it's a results business, Canterbury. Like, you... you essentially live and die by the results, but there's very little you can do to influence what actually happens once that opening whistle goes. How hard is it to ride the roller coaster when it's not going well? Well, it's really hard. Uh, and, you know, when it is going well, the coach is amazing. When it's not going well, it's the co- coach and the CEO's job that's, you know, that's under pressure. So you, you know that when you, when you arrive in that situation, that's what you buy into. Uh, but uh, that... Um, you do wear a different lens. You wear a different lens when you watch a game because you're thinking about how many tickets am I going to sell next week? How many jerseys am I going to sell? Um, you know, someone, your star player gets injured, that's going to have an impact on what you do. Uh, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of things that are going on as well as just enjoying the moment. Uh, so I, it's fair to say I never quite watch a game the same as, as, I, as I used to um, when I could just enjoy it. Um, for the result, now there's a whole lot of other responsibilities that come with that result. Mm. And are you a text the coach after a good result? Like, uh, did you have any sort of traditions that you would do after a win? Well, I always saw him straight after the game, so I never had to text him. I could, I was always there or in the dressing room or saw him, so um, I never had to do that. After now that I'm not with Des anymore, I invariably, um, you know, uh, text him after most games, after most weeks, and just you know stay in touch with him. And we have some good banter on that. Uh, but yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it is, it's an interesting. It's an amazing experience when you're winning and it's really, really tough when you're not. So it's you get the greatest, greatest highs and the biggest challenges from a leadership perspective to try and... And winning's the easy, but you just step back from that. You don't need to be around, you're not seen, you just let them enjoy the moment. But so when you lose, that's the moment you've got to be seen. That's the moment where you're there, that's where the, the moment where you have to be much more visible because that's the more critical moment. Do you watch Ted Lasso? Yeah. Is it is it any close to Rebecca's role at <laughs> Richmond AFC? <laughs> I only wish I had legs like that. Um, uh, well, yeah, it's in, partly. I mean, it's sort of dramatised. Yeah, I mean, obviously, super dramatised. I, I really enjoyed it. The realities of having absolutely no knowledge and being able to carry something like that off is, is kind of absurd, uh, but actually really amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the reality is you do get involved as you gain more experience in recruiting players, you're negotiating the deals for players to come, you're dealing with player managers who are offering you players all the time, getting media ringing you left, right and centre because I've heard a rumour that you're going to trade X for Y and is this true and, um, you know, what's going to happen? Um, 
you know, you're building a roster that's important against a salary cap, and it's not just this year or next year, it's four or five years' time, so you've got depth. So it's, it is it is actually, it's like playing fa- fantasy football, but you're fortunate to get paid for it. Yeah. So it's pretty and, bloody and, good. And, and it's other people's <laughs> careers in your hands as well, right? Because you've got to make the call when things aren't going well to, okay, your time as coach is up, we need, we need to change here. Like, that's a huge responsibility. Yeah, it is, and that's why uh, the leadership piece and coming in the front door and sitting down and being respectful and having honest conversations with players um, so that they heard it from you and didn't hear it through the back door that you were trying to trade them into somewhere else uh, uh, was really important to me. Um, and not everyone ran it like that, and there is a risk that that bites you in the in the bum occasionally, but I'd rather um, know that you came in the front door and had that honest conversation and dealt with the consequences of what that might bring um, than had the alternative, which is not doing that. So after four years with the Doggies, you get named CEO of Rugby Australia. And again, I'm interested in, in how that transition worked and how that interview process was different. to with the, with You're the in a real interview. interview. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love the understanding detail. the interview in this episode. <laughs> so really different. Um, once again, a phone call, would you be interested, go in, have the initial interview with the recruiter and then get to a shortlist and I had six interviews. So um, three, two interviews uh, with the interview panel and then one with the full board um, of Rugby Australia and then with half the board of Rugby Australia and half the chairman of the Super Rugby teams and then the next day or a few days out of the other half of the board and the other half of the Super Rugby chairman. Holy shit. Um, yeah, and it was. It, it was, and, and Cameron Klein, who I had as my chairman during that time, who was you know, a really great chairman to me and really supportive, uh, he uh, has been on record saying we would never have put a male through that number of interviews. I'm going to compare my <laughs> experience of applying for jobs <laughs> with yours here, but you know when you're applying for a job and you're not sure if you want it or not, you just kind of like apply just to see if you get offered it? If you're going through six interviews, were there times when you thought, Shit, do I really want this or did you want it really badly the whole time? Yeah, I wouldn't go through, I wouldn't be that deep into the process unless I really wanted it. So I wouldn't do that uh, around the, uh, maybe I do, maybe I don't, because that says innately to me that your gut's telling you that you're not sure that you really want it. So um, I'd done a lot of due diligence. I'd spoken to a lot of people uh, that were in, the, in and around rugby and, and back into New Zealand. I'd rung Steve Chu and he'd said to me, are you sure? Mm. Um, but yeah, I'd done a lot of due diligence and I was um, a really strong board when I got there and um, you know, a sport that had, has got all of the building blocks um, and to go in there and if you could um, get the support that you needed could make a real difference. How does Des Hasler compare to Michael Checker? Um, yeah, interesting. I, I, I've been fortunate to work with um, a number of very high-profile um, coaches uh, and at the very, very top of their game. They are unique. Uh, they're not normal people. They tend to be workaholics. They, um, you know, Des would like to sleep four hours a night. They have often a very strong um, opinions on things. So, but finding the way to build that relationship so that you can be complementary of each other is really important to me. I managed that with Des. Um, I never managed that with <coughs> Michael. I never managed that with Michael. I couldn't find that wavelength where we would, um, you know, end up in a really strong uh, place. Um, so, yeah, that was disappointing for me. When it's such an important relationship and there's so much at stake, what do you do to try to, like, do, do, would you and Michael go on, uh, not dates, but would you, like, do things together to try to build relationships? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, you certainly, um, you know, spend time together, support them with the things that they are looking to try and achieve um, uh, so that, you know, you can have that really good chicken challenge. And ultimately, everyone has to win. Um, they have to win uh, and uh, see that administration's adding value to their high performance environment. Equally, they have to understand that there's some boundaries and they can't just do whatever they want. Um, and that's the trust and respect that you're looking to build over the time so that they, you can ultimately help them do the things they want to do, but also with respect uh, when they when you have to say to them, well, actually, no, you can't take that camp there or go there or have that extra piece of equipment. <coughs> 
they understand the, the, the reasons and the rationale for that. Uh, so it started in December 2017, and in April 2018, five months after you start, Israel Folau makes his first comment that gay people will go to hell unless they repent. And he wasn't sanctioned, uh, but he was warned that he was in breach of Rugby Australia's inclusion policy, which was designed to protect minorities in the game. He deleted the comment. A year later, he makes an Instagram post which says the same thing, which sent Australia and New Zealand and uh, the world into a spin. Do you remember when you were first alerted to that second post in April 2019? Mm, I do. I do. Um, so the first post, I'm a great believer and everyone's got a right to make a mistake uh, and just don't make the same mistake twice. So first time, lots of conversation, understanding uh, the implications, the risks, the employment risks. You've got an employment contract that says you can do some things, you can't do other things. Do we all understand that? Yes, we understand that. Are we going to do it again? No, we're not going to do it again. Um, Is that face-to-face or a group-to-group conversation? So two, I, we had some with his manager and group-to-group group, uh, and uh, then um, I had a one-on-one um, conversation uh, with Israel and, yep, he shook my hand and said he wouldn't do it again. And it's fair to say I don't have the same faith in handshakes that I had previously. Yeah. Uh, and, yep, understood that the second time it was going to be enormous uh, and immediately and it just went absolutely crazy. Uh, and then you go into crisis management mode. So how, who alerted you? How did you find out? About Media manager crisis? rang me. Rang you, Raylene. Um, we've got a, we've got, not, <laughs> we've got a situation <laughs> here. <laughs> Brace yourself. That's right. We've got a situation. Uh, yeah, and then you just basically go through the steps of what managing a crisis looks like, um, making sure your board's informed that you've got their support. That checker, Mike, Michael Checker, was informed that the team, your legal team, all of that stuff, and just then slowly just work through the process. Ring all the sponsors because they were all invested, deeply invested in it. Uh, and you just w- slowly but surely work through those those processes until um, uh, you get to an outcome. And ultimately, uh, this w- there was not there was no coming back from the situation. True to the book of Raylene, are you personally doing those phone calls to sponsors and and key stakeholders? Some I couldn't do all of them yep. um, because you know you've got probably know, twenty odd sponsors, so I couldn't do all of them. But certainly the big ones like Qantas, um, and uh, knowing how invested they were as a as the major sponsor and. Uh, you know, some of the previous conversations and journey we'd be on. So, you, yeah, they certainly, um, I made those um, com- um, phone calls. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, 20 hour days, making sure that you've got a plan in place, what you're going to do, how you're going to execute it, uh, and then ultimately, you know, make the, the decision um, that terminating his contract is the right thing uh, for Rugby Australia because of the breach of the employment contract. Uh, and also, we had a group, we had a diversity and inclusion policy. Um, that was part of the employment contract, but more importantly, it was something that everyone at Rugby Australia had signed up to. So as a CEO, I've got a responsibility to provide a safe environment for the staff, and I've had a number of gay staff, and they were scared. They felt bullied, they felt uncomfortable. I had some um, female um, gay players who wouldn't be in the gym at the same time. So those things become, uh, you know, important um, responsibilities that I've got as a CEO so uh, all, and those things aren't popular to discuss like that's not there's none of that in the media because it's not not the fun stuff to discuss. This would be the hardest challenge of your career I'm interested I mean you kind of answered it like that first 24 hours you said you, you sort of worked 20 of them I can't imagine you would be able to sleep right like this thing is like the biggest story in the world as the snowball builds like how are you mentally are you mentally okay like is it over overpowering? No um because you've got your trusted advisors uh, and I've got my trusted advisors, uh, which are always uh, four or five people that are very important to me, that are very experienced, that are watching these things from a distance, uh, that are giving me advice uh, and uh, that's who you have to listen to. You can't manage a situation like this by the back page of the newspaper, what they're saying on TV or social media. Um, you have to have a plan, you have to have the key people agree to that plan um, and then you have to execute it as close as you possibly can to get to the outcome, knowing that it's going to come at you from every possible angle. 
but ultimately you've got a job to do um, and you need to stay the course to make sure you deliver to them. And then it's it's a protracted end solution, right? Is it eight, eight months? Eight months, that yeah. it, That it kind of goes on for? Uh, the fires are burning externally. How are you managing the in-house staff and the communication in there? Like, you, you've kind of, you're fighting fires, I guess, on, I don't know if fighting fires is the right term, but there's two separate communications going here, right? The external one about this is how we're handling it and then the internal one about this is how we're handling it. Are you running those two plays concurrently? Yeah, with help. I mean, I do it all myself. I it's an amazing team of people that worked with me and, and supported me and gave me really good advice. I mean, that's the, the, what I would say is when you're dealing with something that's such a big um, crisis or public relations challenge is make sure you have some external public relations advice uh, that's not inside the environment that is actually sitting at a helicopter level watching um, and giving you advice. They're not emotively or emotionally involved in the situation, so they can be more objective. That's certainly a big learning. Um, but, yeah, the, the reality is consistent communication internally, making sure that the staff and your sponsors and all the people that are really close, that the rugby community understands what you're doing. Uh, and then, um, yes, you're dealing with legal issues and you know challenges and... Um, Though all of those um, elements, but um, making sure that you're communicating to the people that um, are with you every day the facts so they know what's happening so that the bar- they feel safe in a barbecue conversation because they're going to go to the barbecue on the weekend and everyone's going to go, oh my God, what's happening with that thing? So um, you know, helping them um, have some information to be able to manage those situations is important. Definitely a few organisations that were looking at your diversity and inclusion plans and planning and looking at how they compared to theirs, right? Because it it's a situation that transcends sport into a whole bunch of other areas too. Did you get many CEOs picking up the phone and contacting you about how do we do this? Should this happen to us? We did, and also a lot of universities wanting to use it as a case study around the world around, because it was really probably the first in the world where it's an unusual dynamic when you're the CEO of a a high-profile sport because uh, people around you get paid more than you, um, they're more high-profile than you are, and so therefore the dynamic of what makes the story is that they are the voice and they can, you know, often control the narrative because of how big they are. So, As in the athletes. As in the athletes, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that athlete that does something wrong, that becomes the story or that's the athlete that makes a comment on something. So um, that's a very different dynamic than usually in a business. The CEO is the most high-profile person and therefore the person that's stepping forward. And um, So, yeah, it was, it was a perfect storm in a lot of ways. The female CEO versus the greatest player and you know those um, you know types of headlines were fantastic from media point of view but for all of that noise and how difficult that was um, it was a breach of an employment contract from where we were sitting and we just had to deal with that and what was in front of us and you had to keep coming back to you know employment contract safe environment those were the two things that just kept us on course. The court of public opinion um, that eight months was tough I was working at the Herald at the time like a Falau headline, like you say, was the the most clicked on story on the site pretty much every day across those eight months. There was so much media around you and your position. When it got really bad, how much of that stuff gets to you, the, the social media sort of criticism or the media criticism? How much of that actually sort of gets through? Um, so a couple of other bits of advice. When you're in the media, don't read the media. Uh, and I was fortunate to have a media team who could read it and give me a gist of, you know, what um, what it was saying, what the sentiment was, where it was going. The same with social media. Don't read social media. Um, you wouldn't get out of. I would not have got out of bed in the morning if that had been, um, you know, if I if I'd had to take all of that on board. Um, because you you go searching. The risk is you go searching for the good stuff, and then because you want. Um, confirmation that you're heading in the right direction and you want um you don't you know you get horrified by the negative stuff so don't and it takes some discipline not to do that but that's a reality uh as i said those trusted advisors who were giving me some feedback um if you know if things weren't um quite right uh, were really really important uh and your family and your friends and your um you know checking in on you and making sure your colleagues that you know well, sending you a text, being supportive, just making sure you're okay. It's, it's hugely, hugely important. And, and people don't realise how important it is uh, when someone just makes an effort to send you a text message uh, to say, you know, hey, just checking in, are you okay? 
because it is difficult. Um, you know, did I, in the moment, because adrenaline's going and you know you've got an outcome to get to, it's okay. It's the time later probably when you get a chance to reflect on it that you have to make sure that you um, have some time to process it and work through it. Um, yeah, good days and bad days, but by far and away, um, you know, when you truly believe in something and you believe that you've made the right decision for, for the situation in front of you and for the future of what your sport will look like or your organisation will look like, um, you know, that makes you determined, makes, made me determined to get to that end point. So reflecting on that now, like to, to have gone through that and come out the other side, are you one of these people that you believe you learn more from your failures than your successes? Like you must be so well placed to deal with whatever the world can throw at you challenges, at this point. Challenges, challenges. challenges more than failures, I would suggest. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, winning hides a multitude of sins, right? Like when you when everything's going hunky dory, that's when you think it's all great. But the reality is, it's the challenge or the loss or the you know difficult situation that you learn a lot more from. Um, you know, when you do have to face the reality that you're getting death threats, um, and you know, I didn't think anything of it. And I happened to passing throw away at some stage. Oh yeah, um, oh yeah, death threat. People were like. Beg your pardon? Yeah. <laughs> and so next thing there's like security checks going on and they were checking the building and they were checking our apartment to make sure that people couldn't get into our apartment and you know I, mean, I hadn't sort of really taken those things very seriously but um, people around me took them a bit more seriously. Uh, so yeah those those things are, um, are confronting um, and you know the experience of going through something so high profile uh, but um, you can only take the moment to learn from the things that you would do differently or, or the learnings out of it, um, because otherwise it's not worth doing it. It's an unfortunate, uh, unfortunate, I guess, companion of your career, some of that public opinion and that, and that scrutiny, um, your alopecia, as well as something that's come up um, over years to the point where you felt compelled to speak about it publicly. Does that get t- like how tiresome? How tiresome does that get to have to address those sorts of things? Or, or, and how does that help or manifest itself in terms of building that thick skin for dealing with professional challenges at the same time? Yeah, I mean, I talk about the resilience, and I think uh, no matter what happens in your life, it builds a level of resilience, which helps you deal with the next challenge. And uh, when you're dealing with something difficult or a crisis or having that layer of resilience to not sweat the small stuff, to know what fight to pick, to know when to walk away from certain things, uh, those are all the things that, that those experiences give you. Um, there is no doubt, um, as you said, I'm sure I've got alopecia areata, which means you know I wear a wig, um, I've got no hair, no eyebrows, and I cop some really horrific social media commentary. Uh, you know, are you too lazy to? Because at some stage I wear a headscarf, and you know, what are you, a, a Muslim or a pirate? Are you too lazy to get out of bed and do your hair in the morning? Like, why, why don't you make a better effort? Um, now, males don't face that, so there is definitely a piece of overlay uh, around being a female leader that puts you into the middle of conversations that male leaders don't have to face, uh, and. Yeah, you can either think that's all too hard or you can try really hard to help change that conversation, um, which is why I talk publicly about the alopecia piece because I didn't want people to think I had cancer. I didn't want people to think the job was too tough and my hair was falling out because it's an autoimmune disease. Um, And equally, I wanted to help the other young women there are out there who have got alopecia and to show them that, yes, you can go on and have a career and do other things and find a way to to work through it. and I mean, lucky to have, you know, lots of parents ring me or young women say to me, you know, thanks for sharing your story because it's it's made a difference. So, um, you know, you can either, I'm just innately half glass full. Um, I'm a realist, but I know that if you can take the positive out of that uh, and share that story, then it will end up being a better outcome uh, than not talking about it at all. So after Rugby Australia, you leave there and you come back to New Zealand and you get the uh, Sport New Zealand role in December of 2020. After so long in Australia and then coming back, did, was that a good feeling coming home? Did, did you come home with a sense of purpose? 
Uh, I did. Greg and I had always thought that it was our time in Australia was an adventure. And unfortunately, we finished, I finished at Rugby Australia in the middle of COVID. Uh, otherwise, we probably would have gone off and had a few months away and travelled the world. But that was quite difficult during COVID times. And um, we came back, had two weeks in um, MIQ and, and got out. And uh, it felt like putting on my most comfortable pair of slippers. I don't actually wear slippers, but um, <laughs> it's like that, that it's moment. the only pair of shoes you don't have in that, in that, <laughs> wardrobe, in that we wardrobe we've heard. <laughs> now, now, someone's been telling, t- telling tales. Um, yeah, so I did, uh, but I've seen a maturity in New Zealand that makes me feel really proud. Um, and um, the maturity of our gender diversity and the way we're approaching opportunities, our te ao Māori uh, growth um, that is bringing New Zealand to life and giving us a point of difference, which I just think is so enormously fantastic, uh, that um, it made me feel really proud to be back. So um, to see the good stuff that's happening here, the belief that this mighty country can, 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 can continue to deliver great things on the world stage of sport, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great place to be. Can I jump on that te ao Māori point there and, and ask how your journey with Te Ao Māori is going. I think you have Napui descent. Yeah. Um, how is that going for you? Uh, yeah, it's going um, early stages. Uh, I think uh, mum and I, mum, so through mum's side, so mum uh, who um, also, you know, lawn bowls. Yeah, let's not sleep <laughs> um, on, Mar- not, let's not sleep on, on, on Mar- Marlene's Mar- achievements as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, amazing. Uh, mum, uh, uh, who uh, went to four Commonwealth Games playing lawn bowls, uh, you know, through her side. And... Uh, she, um, uh, we decided we'd go back to the marae and we did that probably about three or four months ago now. Uh, that was that was fantastic to go back and have that experience. Uh, but I think I um, that that little piece was it was great. But actually, my experience in my day to day work uh, of uh, our responsibilities to bring the treaty to life. Uh, for New Zealand, I've been up close and personal with many of the iwi that have taken their settlements and turned them into billion dollar businesses and doing great things for their iwi and their people uh, and uh, helping New Zealand have an experience and understanding of that. Uh, you know, we see it on our sports fields, you know, the, the, we all see the haka, we go, oh gee, isn't that great? But when you actually understand the meaning and the, sport, the teams make the effort to describe to you why they're doing that haka, the story, where it comes from, why I'm doing it, what it actually means, that's all part of growing, um, uh, living to New Zealand's history in a way that will make us a much stronger country in the future. Is, is Australia, is, is politics and sport in Australia stronger than it is here in New Zealand? <clears throat> uh, politics in a sport in Australia is much bigger than it is here, um, but that's more about power, control, money, uh, newspapers, um, headlines, ownership, than than government politics, um, and that was probably something I didn't really comprehend until I um, was living in the middle of it. How big driving that big machine around gossip and he- newspaper headlines and stories and broadcast and trading information and leaking information, which is something I never did uh, through my time, and that frustrated a lot of journalists, And but just wasn't my modus operandi. So, yep, so it's very different. So m- come through the front door more here. doesn't mean New Zealand doesn't have politics. Of course we do. But I think in general we tend to have the conversation. You had quite a challenging start to your life uh, back at Sport New Zealand. <laughs> I was going, where were we going with that one? <laughs> okay, that's Sorry. good. <laughs> All over the place. <laughs> um, you had quite a challenging start uh, to your return to New Zealand. Uh, in your first year, you had the death of Olivia Podmore. And, I mean, what a, what a sad, tragic uh, tale. But I'm, I'm interested in the leadership around it because I'd heard that once you heard the news, you went straight to Cambridge. You didn't really know what where exactly you were going, but you felt it was important to go and be there and sort of support anyone you can. Can you tell me about that, like how you led through that period? Yeah, well, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? I, I, to me, that was just innately the right thing to do, is that you were literally, I was at work at, 
five thirty at night I was actually trying to get out the door to go to a dinner meeting and I got a phone call to say there's something's not quite right here and it was obviously incredibly, incredibly challenging time and, you know, I've been fortunate to meet both Olivia's mum and dad and spend some time with them through this really difficult time and I'm um, you know, it was it was, you know, challenging for teammates, for parents, for organisations. Uh, but in that very moment, uh, knowing that there would be media interest, it's easier for me to front that media because of my experience. It's one of those moments where you go, when you've got TV cameras and you've had that experience, that's one way that you can help. So I um, jumped in the car, went to Cambridge, spent the day just supporting people, having conversations, trying to understand who we needed to look after, make sure that we had some very distressed people that they were getting support and counselling that they needed um, and then ultimately finished the day with a press conference which you know, like I said when you've got that experience that's something that you can help um, guide the, the CEO of cycling through as well and stand beside them and look like a united front and I think that's just important in those moments. Yeah it is yeah it, that sort of empathy and that togetherness I think um, it builds strong teams which is is what we've heard from you all through the journey. What does it mean Sorry, where uh, where are we at as sport in New Zealand at the moment? There were challenges when you came in, and, and there was uh, you know a lot of reports and sort of the high performance uh, aspect is is being questioned about the, our way of doing it. Where are, are things improved? High performance sport around the world has had its me too moment. So, um, you know, where we had Harvey Weinstein acting unprofessionally on the casting couch, equally around the world we've had coaches and administrators acting um, incredibly badly. Uh, and um, at the time we didn't know it was bad because that was the way it was. Coaches yelling and screaming and swearing and, um, you know, not uh, explaining to athletes why they've been selected or why they've been dropped. Um, you know, creating forced situations uh, to create outcomes. Uh, you know, those um, in might have been okay in 1984, but they're not okay in, in 2023. So um, the hard thing is those very behaviours have got great results. And we have some people, um, you know, that we can look at internationally and domestically that have been hugely successful whose methods would not stand up in 2023. So that's a cultural change that needs to happen uh, across the whole world, and it's happening. You've seen it. Um, you know, Simone Bowles coming out and talking about you know, the experience that she's had, um, the uh, expectation that our New Zealand athletes have to have a voice at the table, and uh, we are incredibly supportive of that. Uh, as At High Performance Sport New Zealand, that's part of the strategy to try and help grow that space where coaches can feel... Um, educated and supported to change their style um, without compromise that they get sacked because they have a season that doesn't go so well maybe or um, that they might not know what to do so how do you help them on that journey um, equally um, you know athletes can step into that conversation and express their views knowing there's no consequence for them uh, because for many athletes over the years there was consequences um, of um, standing up and speaking for, about what you believed in or challenging the coach or standing up and challenging and that's unf that's fortunately not the way it should be anymore. So there's, there's change happening around the world um, and from that you will see some coaches that you know were successful not employed anymore because that type of behaviour is now not the way it needs to be. I think it's an important juncture here to differentiate between Sport New Zealand and High Performance Sport New Zealand, right? Are you able to give a really concise summary of the difference between the two organisations, one that you lead and one that I guess you work closely with? So I, yeah, I lead both, so I'm group CEO across both of them, uh, and which is which was a change, it wasn't when I started, I right. was Sport New Zealand when I started. And okay, then, so that's news to me. Yeah, over that time um, they um, decided to bring it together, so under a group CEO, which I think is um, helps in the end-to-end -end discussion points. So in short term, Sport New Zealand, um, everybody to be more active across New Zealand with a particular focus on our tamariki and rangatahi, um, particularly focused on our communities that miss out, our women and girls, our young people with a disability, um, and our Māori and Pacific communities that don't always get the opportunities that everyone else um, gets. And then we advocate into government and policy and look at what international good looks like. Um, so that's the Sport New Zealand role. 
uh, working with all of our NSOs, regional sports trusts, um, territorial authorities, councils. High performance, uh, more specific uh, in the um, try inspiring performances every day, um, working with our NSOs to identify for those um, sports to identify the athletes that can win on the world stage to make New Zealanders proud in simple terms. Uh, but you, the piece meets in the middle because the pathway, so what inspires a young Susie to ultimately want to be Lisa Carrington um, and how does she see her way through that process to understand where I need to go, how do I go through, what are the challenges of being a female athlete, they're different to a male athlete because we used to treat women just like little men, we used to do all the same things to the women that we did to the men uh, and now there's different um, you know, strength and condition, conditioning regimes, health regimes, support regimes for female athletes and there are for male athletes. So, you know, those things are very different. So that's the, over here, as many people active as possible, over here find the really good ones and help to support them win on the world stage. Is it a bit boring now going back to work day to day after, <laughs> after those high profile events have left our shores? Uh, well, yes, different. And I mean, I think that's the, now that you've seen how we can deliver events successfully, we're respected on the world stage for delivering those events. Uh, you can turn um, female athletes into household names so that they become everyday uh, parts of people's conversation. That's ultimately what drives broadcast, it drives what, what drives commercial revenues. Therefore, you start that positive momentum of how to grow women's sport. Uh, that's part of the strategy and what you are um, aspire to, to be part of so yeah it's it's certainly different and you know what is the next thing for New Zealand from a major event point of view but more importantly it's about making sure we've got those athletes ready to go off to Paralympics and Olympics in Paris next year and that our young people continue to have great opportunities to play active reckon sport whatever they want to do in our country. I've got a little section here headlined CEO tips <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I think you're really well positioned to, to speak on these. And I've heard you use some of these nuggets, but I want to share them with our audience. Uh, when you get offered a job, always ask for a pay rise. Especially if you're a woman, um, because I think that's the piece where the gender diversity gap starts uh, right from the very first moment is women are anxious not to step into the opportunity in the first place, to hold their hand up and say, yes, I'm going to give that a crack because they think they're missing some skills. Um, without making a big generalisation, males innately step into that opportunity and just say, yeah, I can do that. Um, so we need to step into opportunities. Um, Is there a Richard Branson mantra that you use around that, that you can yeah, share? Yeah, if, if, um, uh, when you get offered a great opportunity, say yes and then work out how you're going to do it after. And innately men do that, big generalisation, but innately men do that, innately women are more conservative about that. Um, did use that example at when I got asked to give the oration at the New Zealand Australia anaesthetists conference. Probably doesn't go that well when you're an anaesthetist. <laughs> probably don't want them just having a crack. Uh, probably want them to be really sure about what they're doing. Um, but you know, innately, and then you know, once you get offered the first um, offer, ask for another five grand or another three or seven or twenty-five. It doesn't matter because. Um, innately that's what the men do and the worst thing that they'll say is no and they might say but I'll review it in six months time which is an opportunity that you didn't have previously. What are normal nerves? Well, Normal nerves is that imposter syndrome that um, many females talk about and I think we've got to get over it. Um, I don't think, um, uh, I understand it's real uh, and I absolutely understand the, that gnawing voice in the back of your head and that sick feeling you get in your tummy but that's normal, that's normal nerves and we have to accept that's what it is uh, and call it out and own it and step into opportunities. The hardest part of your job I imagine is when you have that conversation and you've got to make someone redundant. Do you have ways of making that process easier? Do you have strategies for, for how you approach that? Uh, it depends on who it is, it depends on the situation. I mean you always want it to as be as manner enhancing as possible. So I think being really clear about the rationale and the reasons, making sure that you can be financially, fiscally responsible with that person and give them what they deserve so that they can be safe um, and you know support their family through that transition or you know whatever that next phase is, if you're fortunate to be in that situation. Uh, and um, you know, if you, if you can help them find the next opportunity or give them a reference or do those things, um, that's important. 
if they're leaving for not the best reasons, you have to be responsible with that information that you that you share next time round. But yeah, I mean, I think I'm just a great believer in being prepared to have the hard conversation yourself. So you sit down, you have the conversation. Um, depends who it is, because you know, if you, if you've got a junior person, that would freak them out having the CEO sit them down, <laughs> right? So so you need you know you need to be appropriate. But but anyone that I've ever had to terminate a player or or a staff member, um, I'll always do that conversation myself. You've got an incredible vernacular. Do you have a glossary of terms that you kind of keep <laughs> and that you always refer back to? Because they're really, really good. There's some great nuggets in there. Yeah, it's a little bit of over time, and I think, you know, um, get asked to do some leadership speaking and being able to give people those nuggets to take away and so they can hold them. Um, I was fortunate to see some people do that when I was coming through my career, and I'm Malcolm Speed, I don't know if he was Cricket Australia CEO and CEO of the ICC for a while, and you know he had a really great leadership presentation, and I took two or three th- things away from that. So, you know, I think it's you know you learn from the people you learn from, and um, how you grow your repertoire, and and if I can do that with some young up and coming leaders, uh, and and they can take those things away, and you know think about how they unpack them in their own way, then, yeah, that's, that's a good thing. Because your use of analogy is great. The one that I really like is uh, when you're starting a new role, you're drinking from the fire hydrant. Yeah. That's so good. And then eventually you drink from the, the garden hose. Yeah. It's, it's really good. Like, to, to be able to paint that picture is, is really good in, in terms of using your words. Like, it, it must be an incredible... Meaning, meaning what? For the first little while, you oh, you're just, just going everywhere. Yeah, well, like, you miss a whole lot of it. It's a, when it, like, the fire hydrant, like, comes at you and you don't realise that a whole lot goes past, but over time you realise that you did pick up a lot more of that stuff than you realise and you start to join the dots and then suddenly it becomes like a garden hose and you can drink from it and manage all of that different kind of information and and detail. The brain's an incredible thing and it picks up way more than you ever give it credit for. You can't join the dots though, right, until you start to get some context. Yeah. Um, Last few bits and pieces, can can you take... Can you tell us about Greg and the support he provides for you in your professional capacity? We've spoken about all these sort of huge jobs you've had and and he's been along there for support. How how important is that? Yeah, it's incredibly important and, um, you know, I couldn't have done the jobs that I've done without Greg's support. Um, He uh, is my biggest fan, he's my biggest supporter um, and he, you know, he will say, if he was sitting here, he would say my job is to make Rayleigh's life um, in the, at home or outside of work as easy as possible so that she can go off and do what she needs to do. He's um, also an extrovert. I'm lucky to take him to a function and I said, like, I've got to go and he'll just talk to anyone, random strangers, um, have a conversation with them. They're all going, wow, this bloke, yeah. you know, he's good. He's um, So, you know, he's that's been hugely advantageous and you wouldn't um, have been able to do that, um, you know, these jobs without um, that. Um, you know, we... Um, we couldn't have kids, uh, and so uh, that throws a different moment on you where you um, realise you've got two choices. You either crawl up in a ball or you think, I'm going to you know, make the most of the career opportunity. So m- you know, my brother and sister-in-law um, uh, and their two children, so um, Ryan and Paula and, and Riley and Finn, um, have provided that amazing support to us to be the whānau that we couldn't have ourselves but they've been an important part of that network so between you know mum and dad and and their partners and and um, Ryan and Paula and the kids and and Greg I've got this really tight-knit group that always has my back um, will always be honest with me uh, and keep it real Uh, and that's a great thing when we get together we all just we're all just people that you know get up and wash the dishes at the end of the night and that keeping it real has been something that um, you know, mum and dad taught Ryan and I right from when we were young, uh, and um, you know we t- you know step in, be authentic, but keep it real because that's what um, you know that's what good Kiwis do. Yeah, the foundation piece of yours is so strong. From uh, what uh, on the outside is, yes, it was an incredibly sporting household, but just a typically typically Kiwi household as well, which seems to have held you in really good stead no matter where you've gone um, on your career so far. Yeah, and mum and dad, whilst not being particularly um, kind of like, I don't think they really quite realised how ahead of the time they were in um, making sure that Ryan and I had equal skills. So I learnt to cook, Ryan learnt to cook. I had to change a tyre, Ryan had to change a tyre. We both could use a hammer and nails. We, um, you know, both equally got um, offered opportunities to do things equally. There was never any 
um, you're a girl, you do this, you're a boy, you do that. And, um, you know, that uh, for me was, you know, I, you know, I don't even <laughs> think I'm a, like, someone actually asked me during the week, so when you, you know, like, did you, do you notice that you're the only girl in the room? And I'm like, no, I actually never do. Um, I do now, I didn't, I do now because it's important that I make the comment to uh, why am I the only girl in the room uh, and challenge the environment, which I couldn't have done 20 years ago, but now I'm old, I can do that. First ever is, uh, like it seems that is going to change now. For a long time you were first ever woman, first ever woman too. And while I imagine that became tiresome after a while. It's still an incredibly um, special position to have been in, given the people that are following in behind as well. Do you look back on that with real pride? I, I know publicly you you don't put the gender to the forefront, but there must be a little part of you that goes fucking absolutely. Like I am the first one to do it, and I'm and I'm so happy that the other people, are, the, the other women, are coming in behind. Uh, yeah, there'll be a moment for that. I probably don't. Um that's now for me now is not that moment I think uh, you know I was ha really happy to be the first but I didn't want to be the only uh, and hasn't been another female in the NR CEO in the NRL um, will there be another female in a um, top you know eight or ten uh, rugby country in the world uh, I don't know and that w would be what really great success looked like for me is that you had built um, or showing people that it's possible and both the females felt comfortable to lean into that and the people that were making the appointments were com comfortable with those appointments and, and it's got to be a two-way thing it's both of those pieces have to happen other than that goal do you are you the sort of person that looks forward and has things that you want to tick off like do you look into the future and is there places that you want to be a little bit um but not i'm not a mad planner um in fact, some people would probably say I don't plan enough. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I know there's still some things that, you know, I'd like to tick off. I'd love to work in US sport. I think that would be amazing. I've been a Lakers fan for 45 years, but don't tell anyone. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, you know, that would be, you know, the real pinnacle. Uh, but there's still a lot to do here in New Zealand, and I still think we're doing a lot really well, uh, and we've got a lot to be proud of. So I'm really proud to be part of that system at the moment. Would you ever cross over into politics? No. That's a hard no? <laughs> uh, no, yeah, no. Um, I, it's, it is a hard no. It's not really, it's never been the sort of thing that um, uh, has interested me. Uh, you know, I have such admiration for so many of um, the politicians that get a really hard time and when you're close to them and you see how hard they work and how many hours they work and... You know, the, every week on a Friday they get a bag of papers, which is like four telephone books thick, and they read that on a Sunday to get ready for next week. You know, that's the thing that public don't see. I think that's really... That's what I assumed you were doing. <laughs> no, no, that's Ray what I thought your, your job was. Roasting, she's roasting the lamb on the Sunday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not quite four telephone books. <laughs> for all of your vast experiences, and you've, you've touched on the NRL grand final, but are there any other pinch yourself moments where you've had a chance to sit there and go, wow, this is amazing? Yeah, I've been so, so fortunate. And, um, you know, Delhi, Commonwealth Games, um, gold medal, double overtime, um, massive underdogs uh, to win that in double overtime. Um, amazing highlight, 12 months later, lose in double overtime, 12 months later to Australia. Um, that's not great. Um, losing the NRL grand final, that's not great. Um, you know, be part of a team that sees the Wallabies playing at Twickenham with 90,000 people, you know, um, and, you know, sitting in the Royal Box having that experience. I mean, those are things that are, you know, amazing. But it's not just those experiences. It's it's standing on the sideline on a, you know, on a, you know, frosty eight morning at 8am and seeing little kids have their first experience and oranges at half time and uniforms that are too big and them just loving that experience that they have and you know seeing a young person with a disability have a chance to be included in something that no one else ever would have felt comfortable asking them to be part of it because the game's been developed those are the things that yes you can have all those great moments um, and you know, I wouldn't change that for the world but those other experiences and the friends that we've made and um, connections that I'll have forever, that's what, um, that's what makes all the, the hard points and the low points and the you know, good and bad points all worthwhile. And just looping back to Greg 
for a second, for all the wonderful support that he provides, um, do you have a hall pass and why is it Bruce Springsteen? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure that Greg would quite sign up for the whole thing. <laughs> but it's fair to say that I have been a Springsteen fan for um, uh, you know, ever since you know I was and when I had a, a poster on my bedroom wall way back when in 1984. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm an absolutely massive Springsteen fan. So uh, yeah, ever get a chance to to listen to his uh, his autobiography, which he narrates himself, it's a great listen. <laughs> Okay, the last one I've got to ask about, and again, this was a plant. Ask her about her online shopping habit and how her <laughs> wardrobe spreads across numerous bedrooms. <laughs> Those are all true. Uh, yes, I, do, I mean, I, I enjoy fashion. I like it. I think as a female leader, it's a point of difference for you. You can own it. Um, you don't have to wear a grey boring suit like all the boys do. Uh, and so for me, that's become a point of interest. It's something I'm... Um, uh, I enjoy, and um, yeah, I do have more than one pair of shoes. Um, and uh, when you don't have to spend money on school fees, you can spend it on shoes. Are you a sneaker with a suit or sneaker with a formal kind of a person? I am today. Yes, yeah, I noticed them as soon as you came in. Yeah. You don't mind the sneaker with a, with formal wear? Uh, it's definitely changed since COVID. I would never have done that mm. before then. Um, and it's also, the, that's the other thing, is age appropriate for a woman. You do have to think about age appropriate. So I wouldn't wear like a polo shirt and with Sport New Zealand on it. Like that's kind of not me. Um, where some of the, you know, the younger guys can get away with that. Um, but you, yeah. Would you wear white shoes to FIFA Congress? <laughs> it was an OFC Congress, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever Real you do, faux pas. you've no, got to I think own I got away it. With it. Yeah, yeah. Well, every you got to own it, right? Yeah. Every FIFA official that was here for the Women's World Cup had navy blue suits and white trainers on. Mm. That's how you could tell they were FIFA people. Well, yeah, I was just trying. I was just trying to, to get back on the train. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Hey, uh, this has been so good. Uh, thanks so much for giving us your time. I'm going to end with um, a last little bit from Jenna, and then I'll throw to Shay and sum it up. Jenna says. Raylene is generous, trusting, resilient, proud, stubborn, funny, unrelenting, and empowering. She genuinely wants to do good, and her legacy will ultimately reflect that. I think of what we've heard across the last 90 minutes is, um, it sort of brings that to life. Like, it's, it's been such an impressive, incredible ride. I know there's so much more to go, but thank you so much for coming in and sharing that with us and our audience. Uh, I feel really honoured, so thank you for giving us your time. Shane? Yeah, yeah, I think that the wonderful thing about that statement is, You've already left an incredible legacy, but there's so much more to add to it. And I've sat here in awe and listening to your wisdom and your learned experience, and you're so forthcoming with sharing that with people, regardless of, of who they are and what they're doing. And, and there's been so many interesting pieces of information, not just from this conversation, but from your, your body of work, which is incredible. So I urge people, if they get the opportunity, to come and, and listen and, and share some time with you and I know that you're welcoming in terms of people coming up and having a yarn um, so I, I do in, encourage people to do that and I, the only other thing is that Stephen and I really look forward to being invited around on a Sunday for a, uh, for a, for a roast <laughs> and, um, and sample that cooking that Jenna speaks so highly of. That can be arranged. Yeah I, I mean I thank you for having me I've, I've really enjoyed it I've listened to a number of your episodes and, and uh, really enjoyed them and uh, uh, up and down to Whangamata, it gives us uh, that period of time, which is uh, really great. So I um, really appreciate the invitation, and thank you for having me. Cheers, Raylene.